Beliefs shape our choices and our morals. So much so, in fact, that some people will continue to believe certain things even when science has shown them to be false. Joining us now for more on this enduring conflict between evidence and personal belief, in Durham, England, Tom Scott Phillips, Senior Research Fellow in Cognition and Evolutionary Anthropology at Durham University. And in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Kelly Bronson, Acting Director of Science and Technology Studies at St. Thomas University. And we're grateful to have both of you on our program on TVO here tonight. I want to start on a bit of a lighter note and just play you a small snippet of a video called If Google Was a Guy. Sheldon, roll it please. Vaccines cause autism? Well, I have one million results that say they don't and one result that says they do. I knew it. Just because I have it doesn't mean it's true! <laughs> All right, let's get into this, shall we? Kelly Bronson, to you first. Why are people, some people, not persuaded by cold, hard, evidentiary facts? Well, I think because often it's not the facts, per se, which are at issue. So in research that I've done on critical public engagements with agricultural biotechnologies, or GMOs, when I interviewed farmers on the Canadian prairie who are resisting these technologies, I found that it, their resistance had less to do with the facts per se than it has to do with the context in which the facts are produced and used. So for example, farmers I spoke with were concerned about the corporate context of the production of facts used in regulatory decision making. Um, and I should also say that the farmers I spoke with were quite technically knowledgeable. So I had come straight from the lab bench. I had left a, a life practicing molecular biology. And I found those farmers I spoke with were not ignorant of the facts. In fact, they had quite a high level of, of knowledge on the technical processes of gene transfer. But their concerns were social and political. And I think that similar um, research that's been done with vaccine refusers um, shows similar things, that particular communities of vaccine refusers are concerned, for example, with the corporate, um, the, the profit motive of drug corporations, and that motivates the refusal. And so these kinds of reactions don't square with the um, probabilistic and statistical evidence of science, to be sure. But I don't think, I, I don't think asking why aren't the public persuaded by the facts is necessarily asking the right question. Okay, well, hopefully we'll ask some of the right questions as we go <laughs> along here. Tom Scott Phillips, uh, what would you add to that? So I'd like to add that uh, the few, uh, a few words about how the mind is set up. Uh, human minds aren't necessarily cold, uh, rational decision makers. In particular, something that psychologists have discovered over many years is something called confirmation bias. So we have certain ways of thinking about the world. We all have our own world views. And uh, when, we are, uh, when we look at the world for new information, when we're given new information, we don't just assess it coldly as uh, science would like us to, but we actually just look for arguments to support the worldview that we already have. Uh, and if those arguments don't support our worldview, we tend to actually ignore them rather than uh, consider things on the balance of all probabilities. And it's worth thinking a little bit about why, why human minds should have this confirmation bias. If you have a classical view of what reasoning is and what it's for, then you might, then confirmation bias just looks like a flaw. So if you think that reasoning is just a tool for make, uh, coming to better information about the world and making better decisions, then confirmation bias just looks like a mistake. It looks like the human mind is not doing very well what it's meant to do. A different way of thinking about uh, what reasoning is for, though, is to think about it in terms of communication and the, uh, the way that we interact with each other on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're interacting with each other all the time. We are doing so right now when we, tr we say things and we try to persuade people of, uh, of certain ways of thinking about the world and to take on board our own world views. And if that's our goal, uh, if it, um, then actually confirmation bias is kind of what we should expect. So if I'm trying to persuade you of something, then I shouldn't look for all the arguments on consider the whole balance of everything. I should just look, like, look for the best arguments to support my world view. And so you can start to understand confirmation bias as something that humans naturally have as a product of the fact that we're such a social creature. We're trying to persuade people all the time. And in persuading people, we're actually biased to pull on information that supports our world view and actually disregard information that, uh, that, that doesn't. 
Well, if you look at the skit, Kelly, that we just saw, that uh, short little uh, blurb about, um, you know, what if Google were a guy, uh, the, the woman in the sketch uh, believes her own intuition about things more than she believes facts. And I wonder, uh, you know, how big a role does uh, intuition play in, in all of this? Yeah, thanks, Steve. I, I think that also adds to what um, Tom Scott Phillips just said, um, the, or aligns with the, the, the Google sketch and, and what Tom Scott Phillips um, is saying, seem to suggest this, this battle or this tension between reason and mere or irrational belief. And I guess what I have found in my qualitative and detailed case analyses of particular publics who are resisting technologies or critically engaging with technologies and scientific practices, I found that the kinds of critiques that these publics are making are not at all irrational. They're actually quite sophisticated. So looking at the, the, the and, and critiquing or analyzing, critically analyzing the context in which a fact gets produced, right? Thinking or being circumspect um, about, about the, the context for the production of scientific knowledge is actually quite a sophisticated critique. Um, but I would say that that Google sketch does make me laugh because I, I do think that um, part of what's going on, um, especially with the vaccine issue, it, it does have to do with the sort of um, the volume and the diversity of information available to, to people in today's media uh, landscape or environment. Well, you know, m most of us in the absence of having the skills and the privilege um, of being able to access and understand the peer-reviewed literature, we're, we're, um, we, we look to gatekeepers, so-called gatekeepers, right, to help us make distinctions between good knowledge and and belief. Um, and this is, I think, an increasingly difficult thing to do when these gatekeepers are disappearing. You know, uh, the media industry is, is cutting the number of full-time journalists, even science journalists. And when more and more people are um, participating in making the news using web-based platforms. So I think one, one thing that's really critical is that people um, sort of have a kind of critical media literacy um, and also a kind of critical science literacy, which is a term that's been coined by the editor of an academic journal called Science Communication. Hmm. And crit Sorry. No, I was just going to say it's vaccines today, but 50 years ago uh, it was something else. And I'm going to play a little clip here from a motion picture okay. that was pretty popular back in the day called Dr. Strangelove, and then we'll come back and chat. Roll tape, please. Have you ever heard of a thing called fluoridation? Fluoridation of water? Uh... Yes, I, I have heard of that, Jack, yes, yes. Well, do you know what it is? No, no, I, I don't know what it is now. Do you realize that fluoridation is the most monstrously conceived and dangerous communist plot we have ever had to face? Now, Tom, this is one of those issues that has not gone away after half a century, and in some respects, I can think of uh, a few municipalities here in the province of Ontario. They've actually taken the fluoride out of the water, uh, out of con <laughs> maybe not out of concern for a communist plot, but because enough people rose up against it and eventually city council responded. Why do you think, to what would you attribute the persistent wow. um, existence of these anti-whatever campaigns in the face of uh, scientific fact? So Kelly's absolutely right that a lot of people uh, out on the ground who are sort of engaged in particular issues uh, have a certain degree of literacy with, uh, when they're enga engaging with science. Uh, but a lot of people, you know, man on the street, uh, maybe not engaged on a day-to-day -day basis with whether it's vaccination, fluoridation or GMOs or whatever it might be. And we tend to rely on a, a lot of what, what psychologists tend to call intuitive theories or folk theories about the world. So this idea is perhaps best illustrated with an example from another domain, and that's physics. So if I just hold, you this, hold up this pen, if I let go of this pen, it's going to fall to the floor. And you know that. You know that if I let go, it's going to fall to the floor. And you didn't need to be taught that. Uh, that's just something you know by virtue of being human and growing up in a normal way. And so you have some sort of intuitive idea of physics, of Newtonian physics, but you didn't have to be taught that. And similarly, we have intuitive ideas about the biological world and about the social world as well. So one intuitive idea we have about the biological world is, uh, psychologists call it essentialism, the idea that animals and plants and other organisms have an essential core which is immutable and unchangeable. And if you think about, uh, and another idea would be disgust, so the idea that 
uh, the, the, these, these immutable cores are not to be polluted without outside, uh, inf uh, outside um, chemicals, toxic toxins, and so on and so forth. And so p th these ideas are very powerful, they're intuitive and natural to us, and, uh, and they sometimes combine in certain ways to make certain messages very powerful. So one message would be an anti-fluoridation idea. So humans have this immutable core where there's a natural sense of what it means to be human, and fluoridation is something external to that. It, it, uh, it taps into our ideas of keeping our, our, our bodies free of poisons and toxins. Um, you know, the same goes for, let's say, some arguments against gen genetically modified organisms. Uh, the idea that we're injecting organisms with something that's not natural to them, that's, uh, that's, that's possibly toxic. Uh, and that's, uh, that's actually very powerful for our intuitive uh, ways of thinking about the world. Well, Tom, I'm glad you brought that up because I have an example here I want to read. It is, it is not impossible, apparently, in this society to change your mind, but it does come with consequences, and it is, for some, very problematic. Yeah. I'm going to read something here from Mark Linus, who was once an anti-GMO activist. He now supports the practice, and he had this to say in the New York Times. He said, on genetic engineering, environmentalists have been markedly more successful than climate change deniers or anti-vaccination campaigners in undermining public understanding of science. The scientific community is losing this battle. If you need visual confirmation of that, try a Google Images search for the term GMO. Scary pictures proliferate. From an archetypal evil scientist injecting tomatoes with a syringe, an utterly inaccurate representation of the real process of genetic engineering, to tumor-riddled rats and ghoulish chimeras like fish apples. Kelly, I'd like uh, your view on how powerful imagery such as this actually influences public opinion. Thanks, Steve. Um, I read that opinion piece, actually, in the New York Times by Mark Linus. Um, and I would just say to begin that I'm not sure that comparing the status of knowledge on GMOs with the robust and long-standing consensus on human-induced climate change is a fair or accurate comparison. But that, that aside, I would agree with um, Linus in, in that the imagery that's often leveraged by anti-biotechnology activists doesn't necessarily, um, it not only does not reflect this, the scientific evidence, that, it, that which exists, but it actually, I don't think, very accurately reflects um, concerns that, that, say, peasant farmers, and that's particularly what he talks about in that opinion piece, right? He talks about um, a, a GM uh, eggplant variety that's, that's not being taken up by Indian farmers. And I, and I think that you know the imagery that speaks to health hazards or environmental concern isn't necessarily speaking to what's at the at, at root of the issue in resistance among peasant farmers in the global south against these technologies. So, so I think a lot of farmers in in India, for example, have concerns about the licensing um, structure that surrounds these technologies. So farmers who use GM seeds have to sign a licensing agreement with corporations like Monsanto, and they have to pay the corporation year after year, which undercuts the historic practice of seed saving, among else. And, and I think that these kinds of issues are really what's at root of much of the, the concern among peasants in the global south around these technologies. And it's actually interesting, there's research that's being done that shows the same that the restrictive nature of these, this um, legal infrastructure surrounding these technologies is actually equally restrictive around, uh, uh, for scientists who want to, public scientists, who want to study the health and environmental effects of these technologies and, and can't do so because of the patenting um, infrastructure. And so I think even if these uh, technologies were proved safe and effective at increasing yield and um, feeding a, the, a, a, a glo growing global population. And I'm sh I'm, I think the jury is still out on that. But even if that were the case, um, I believe that some farmers would still resist these technologies because of, at least in their current legal and regulatory uh, constitution. Let me follow up with Tom on this then. Let's take GMOs out of the equation and just make uh, focus on his more overarching point, and that is that Mark Linus believes that the scientific community is losing the debate uh, for credibility in the public's mind. Do you think he's right about that? Uh, quite possibly. I think uh, that so there are lots of reasons why one might object to genetically modified organisms, uh, and some of them in particular are going to be political and economic arguments, the sort of things that Kelly was just talking about, and some of them might actually be 
very good arguments. They're political and economic questions. Um, but at the same time, it's, it seems to me true that, uh, that in making a lot of those arguments, the p people who are arguing against the use of uh, GMOs are able to tap into certain uh, ways of presenting them. Uh, they're, they're able to present them in certain ways that tap into to natural intuitive ways of, uh, of, the, of the way in which the human mind works, which makes their message particularly appealing uh, and easier to sell, possibly, than, than the arguments of, of pro-GMO campaigners. So they've got, you know, pro-GMO campaigners have a slightly uphill task, but if they have the science on their side, then, then you know, the challenge is there for them to, to meet. Kelly, I've got a minute left. Not much time, I'm afraid, but let me see if I can get you to speak to this. Pew Research looked into this and discovered that when it comes to climate change, for example, 87% of scientists believe it is mostly due to human activity. Only 50% of the public believe that. My question for you is, certainly not on our program tonight, but there are some scientists mm -hmm. and some academicians who are lousy communicators. They w others won't even do media at all. Do they have to change that habit in order to make those numbers line up a little, more, a little better? Yeah, I, th I think so, Steve. I think that what we can do as a science communicator is really, you know, t for two decades or, uh, on GMOs and, and perhaps in the climate issue, we've been sort of pressing the facts, right? Assuming that the, the issue in public science tension it, or public resistance to incorporate evidence in their decision making is an issue of public ignorance of the facts. And I think what, what we really ought to do is step back and try to understand what's at root of particular public responses and then tailor our communication strategies accordingly, mm. right? It's like that, um, you know, is it, is it better to be right or is it be better to be effective? And I think certainly given the, the environmental crisis that is global climate change, it's more important to be effective. And so I think that uh, what needs to happen is a kind of uh, a listening and a tailoring of the message to particular communities of resistors. I think also we can, as, as science communicators, help, and this is what I do with my students in science and technology studies, help members of the public not just understand the facts, but, but gain a kind of critical science literacy. So understand the more complicated things like that uncertainty is I inherent in science given the nature of, of scientific knowledge production, in, uh, induction as, as part of the scientific method, for example. You know, and so teaching students about methodological diversity, about the values as they come into play in science policy making, teaching students about those kinds of things or, and te teaching members of the public those kinds of things then puts them in a better position to, to weigh scientific versus other kinds of information. Gotcha. I want to thank both of you for helping us out with this tonight. Kelly Bronson from St. Thomas University in Fredericton, New Brunswick. Tom Scott Phillips from Durham University in Durham, UK. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.